Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sally Dick, and I'm the bishop of the home of the Chicago Cubs. It's a cheap way to get applause. And I'm here to talk to you about vital congregations and the four areas of focus. As part of your annual conference extended cabinet, you have shown yourself to be a leader who is committed to the mission of our church over the years. During that time, it is my hope that you have been aware of our focus as a denomination on increasing vital congregations and on our collaborative commitment to the four areas of focus. These have been central to our work at, for a decade now, and in this last quadrennium were once again affirmed by the General Conference as a part of the report submitted by the Connectional Table. I chaired a collaborative group of bishops, sec general secretaries, and members of the Connectional Table these last four years. This collaboration has deepened the relationships of leaders across our connection, increasing our capacity to align our energy and resources toward these areas of focus, and have resulted in some uh, strategic directions we brought to the General Conference. These strategic directions put an even finer point on our focus on vital congregations and the four areas of focus bringing to General Conference specific, measurable goals for our denomination. But before we talk about some of these achievements, I want to share a short video with you compiled by the United Methodist Commission on Communication that reminds us of the important journey we've been on as we continually seek to live into a culture of vitality across our connection. The four areas of focus. How did we get here? Well, as mainline Protestant churches began to experience a steep decline in the U.S. membership, the United Methodist Church didn't sit idly in the pews. Instead, church leadership was passionately proactive. So in 2004, the General Conference established the Connectional Table in an effort to coordinate the mission, ministries, and resources of the United Methodist Church. Our task is to, to try to think on behalf of the denomination about what is the vision God would have for us as we look to the future, and how do we enable the whole church um, to, to act together toward that vision that God wants for us. In 2006, an exciting new conversation began taking place in our church, a conversation about long-term vision, a conversation about collaboration, and about how the general agencies could work in partnership to support work that was already going on in local churches. This conversation began to catch the imagination of church leaders, and the general agencies and boards came up with enterprising ideas, or provocative proposals, to ensure that we would remain relevant in our changing world. This launched even more enthusiastic discussion among the general secretaries, the council of bishops, annual conferences, and lay leaders. Key areas of mission and ministry emerged that with careful thought and planning could realign and strengthen the mission of the church. We permitted ourselves to join the rest of the world in complacency. But here, at our 40-year anniversary, for the love of God, the United Methodist Church declares no more. In 2008, the General Conference delegates heard this sharpened vision for collaborative, targeted ministry, which became known as the Four Areas of Focus. With the green light from General Conference, the Church set out to develop principled Christian leaders for the Church and the world, establish new places for new people and renew existing congregations, engage in ministry with the poor, 
stamp out killer diseases of poverty by improving health globally. These aren't new ministries to the church. But this church-wide effort transcended the many competing agendas within the denomination. The integration of budgets, goals, and expertise within our leadership structure it was designed to be more collaborative, more driven, and, well, more focused. The release of the 2010 Call to Action report clearly pointed to a need to cultivate thriving, vital congregations in order to achieve momentum towards our focused goals. Brian, a reminder how much God loves you, Brian. God bless you. By strengthening our congregations, we will see progress in the four areas. Correspondingly, the four areas are a means to revitalize our congregations. And so what we were looking at is for churches that over time tended to involve more people, engage more people, and serve more people. And these are the churches that registered as high vital churches. Vital congregations are integral to our mission, and we believe they will increase local and denominational strength through the four areas. Vital congregations endeavors to measure congregational strength with the understanding that some aspects of church vitality simply can't be measured in numbers. But rather, life-changing, soul-saving relationships that draw the world closer to Christ. In just the last few years, we have planted over 500 new churches in the U.S. as well as nearly 1,700 new church and faith communities in the central conferences provided theological education in remote areas all over the world through the distribution of e-readers. Awarded more than 1,900 seminarians over $4 million in scholarships. Conducted experiential training for hundreds of mission-oriented members and leaders across the U.S. Trained United Methodist Health Boards across the continent of Africa. Distributed over 2 million nets and impacted over 4 million lives through Imagine No Malaria. And deployed more than 300 missionaries all over the world. In the coming quadrennium, we will work to engage three million people in world-transforming activities, form one million new disciples of Jesus Christ, transform 400 communities for vital, abundant living, reach one million children with life-saving interventions. We have ambitious goals. But time and time again, we have shown our strength in unity. We must galvanize our efforts. And we must do this purposefully and passionately. Because yes, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we are ready. Now some of you have been a part of that journey. You've been there. You've done that. You have the t-shirts, literally from all of the, those parts of the journey. But now's the point in which we continue on purposefully and passionately to galvanize our efforts to carry out this mission and to cultivate a culture of vitality so that we can mark together a few achievements that demonstrate our fruitfulness and mission and ministry with this shared, unified focus. In Portland this past May, the Connectional Table submitted a report to the General Conference outlining these accomplishments and laying out strategic directions for the next quadrennium. These directions convey our continual focus on vital congregations and the four areas of focus and bring greater clarity, a finer point, if you will, to these four areas of focus. As we continue to start new faith communities and double the number of highly vital congregations, with God's help, we'll be able to achieve our four strategic directions. You heard them in the video. To engage three million people in world transforming activities. To form one million new disciples of Jesus Christ to transform 400 communities for vital, abundant living, and to reach one million children with life-saving interventions. These are ambitious strategic directions, which should stretch us. And they were established over the course of this last year 
through various means, particularly with the lead denominations. For instance, in reaching the one million children goal, the General Board of Global Ministry did a wide survey of the church, thousands of laity, clergy, and others. They looked at what other health organizations, world health organizations, were doing. And they looked at what their goals were. They gathered together this information and focused on one thing, as big as it is. They focused on one thing, to reach one million children with life-saving interventions. In the midst of this, we will continue to work toward increasing the number of highly vital congregations by measuring growth through member involvement, engagement in the community, and missional giving. Again, we want to monitor these elements of vitality in order to build on what is working and redirect resources from efforts that are not working. As you can see, these areas of focus are not just simply goals that have come down from on high, from the rafters of the general church, some bureaucrat somewhere. They are expressions of some of our most basic convictions as United Methodists. John Wesley started a movement that was committed to preaching the word throughout the world starting new faith communities everywhere he went. He was committed to developing leaders who were principled in their piety, meeting in small groups and classes to hold one another accountable. He, was also fully, he also fully expected that these leaders would be engaged socially in ministry with those who are in greatest need. And he had a particular interest in promoting health and wholeness as an integral part of the abundant life we inherit as a child of God. Now, in our annual conferences, we may not all use the same language, we may not even use the same phrases, but through these four areas of focus connected with making vital congregations and vital congregations working on these four areas of focus, we develop faithful and fruitful ministries all over the world. And we all have a role to play. Everybody in this room has a role to play if we are going to be successful in achieving these goals. The Council of Bishops has a very important role. The leaders from the Council of Bishops ha have committed to building ownership in our annual conferences around these strategic directions. There are leadership teams in the Council of Bishops, and this week we spent a high proportion of our time in these leadership teams, many of them focused around the four areas of focus and vital congregations. The bishops appointed as chairs of these leadership teams are Bishop Gary Mueller, who chairs the Congregational Vitality Leadership Team, Bishop Jonathan Holston, who chairs the Missional Engagement Leadership Team, working with Abundant Health, Bishop Grant Hagia, chairs the Leadership Development leadership team, and moi, the Justice and Reconciliation leadership team. Now, the connectional table has a very important role. Perhaps sometimes you wonder, what does the connectional table do? Well, this is what they do, and particularly around the four areas of focus. They discern and articulate the vision the mission and the ministries of the global church. That is their job. They support these vital congregations through the four areas of focus with the work of three advisory groups. And these advisory groups will help us look for missional trends to strategize, evaluate, and steward our denominational resources toward these desired outcomes. It's important. 
that we stay focused in strategizing, evaluating, and stewarding our resources. The general agencies have an important role in this. Each of these areas of focus have been assigned a lead agency. It will be the responsibility of the general secretary and their teams to work collaborative, collaboratively to resource the church by building connections. It will be the role of the general secretaries to broaden and deepen partnerships between the annual conferences and the general agencies. Last night, you heard Bishop Snazy say that the annual conference exists to equip local churches and to connect those local churches to the general church. We, the annual conference exists for the local church. The general agencies exist to equip annual conferences to be able to fulfill these four areas of focus and build vital congregations. Their responsibility is equipping for mission through educating, resourcing, and mobilizing United Methodists. They will respond, which means they will listen to, talk to, and respond to the needs articulated by residential bishops and annual conferences around all four areas of focus and vital congregations. So I'm going to give you an example of how this works. Ministry with the poor. As I said, ministry with the poor. There. Oh, back one, I think. There you go. I chair the lead I chair the leadership team for Ministry with the Poor. I'm also the president of the General uh, Board of Church and Society. So Ministry with the Poor, one of the things that we have to do is we have to help the church understand what ministry with the poor is. One of the things I've learned is that with is one of the hardest words in English to speak if, you, if your first language is something else. I've noticed this with the Germans. I've noticed this with Koreans. I've, and I've been told that many, many other languages have a hard time with that W followed immediately by the TH. With is hard to say. I would say with, ministry with the poor is also about the hardest attitude and action of the church. We want to do ministry to, and we want to do ministry for. And we have been really good at those kinds of things, if good is the right word. But ministry with is something else. Ministry with is building relationships, understanding, and working together with our communities to be able to strengthen them in all ways that will lead to abundant life. So for instance, I have this wonderful little church out in the rural part of Illinois. Yes, my conference has a rural part. And they wanted to do something for those poor people around the church. So they figured they would do what churches do. They would open a food pantry. But the people in their community didn't need a food pantry. There were other places that they could get food. So they actually went out the door, began to talk to people, to build some relationships, not only with the people around them, but in the community. And they discovered that what they really needed were what were called necessary essentials. Toilet paper, toothpaste, feminine products, and so they began to build this whole ministry with the people in their community around what they needed. It's a simple little tiny example of the difference of doing two and four compared to that hard attitude for us as a church, which is to do ministry with. John Wesley said one great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit 
And I would add, no, love them. Hence, it is that one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. How do we build ministries with the poor? So, um, now back to that complicated, uh, there you go. So, this is, this is uh, an example of how people, how we all work together. The General Board of Church and Society is the lead agency, for instance, for ministry with the poor. They're connecting and equipping an annual conference who is also sharing and identifying needs to them. And so I'll give you again another example from my annual conference. Uh, we have the Chicago Urban Strategy where we try to build the capacity of local churches to engage in ministries with their communities. We have some problems in Chicago. We have extreme poverty and we need to be able to be a a, a positive force with our communities. So one of the ways in which we have partnered with program agencies is that in one tiny pilot project, we have two churches from every district who have been trained by a community organizer from General Board of uh, Church and Society and through General uh, Commission on Religion and Race training together they have tra trained people in local churches in community organizing skills, such as one-on-ones and other things, to actually, when they go out the doors of the church, they know how to build relationships. You can't just send them out. People don't know what to do when they get out there. And then, through General Commission on Religion and Race, working on cultural competence, so that when they get out there, they're building good relationships. And again, ministry with the poor. And so we have partnered with our program agencies, connecting, equipping, sharing, identifying. We hope we're able to share some good stories uh, in how we're um, identifying and working with 400, uh, 400 communities around our whole denomination. That's about three communities in each annual conference. That doesn't mean you open a, a food shelf, but you're actually transforming a community. And we continue to be able to communicate and celebrate what we are doing. I'm sure that you have some of those ministries going on in your areas as well. Now, what about the annual conference's role? The annual conferences play a critical role in all of this because the annual conference's purpose is, as I said, to equip local church to make disciples and connect the local church to the wider church and the world. In the 2017 to 2020 quadrennium, we will be measuring the progress of our success in these strategic directions by data collected from the annual conferences, not the general church. Oh, that was music to your ears. But over the last quadrennium, a committee within the connectional table has been working to design a connectional assessment that should be music to your ears. This is a tool that will take seriously the connectional table's role of evaluating general program agency and all connectional structures of the church as they collectively seek to aid annual conferences and local churches. Since the annual conference is the basic unit of the church, we want to make sure that you have what you need to cultivate a culture of vitality, to collaborate in mission and ministry that exemplifies our values, and to do so as leaders who know the context you serve. Your needs are different, and so are your strategies. We will be looking at how the, str the strategies that you the extended cabinet leadership are implementing in your annual conferences how their, and their needs for resourcing and how your disciples are being equipped for this mission and ministry. This is a major evaluative undertaking, but we believe it will increase our capacity for mission, help us to learn from one another's successes and challenges, help us to continue to strive for continuous improvement, 
and allow us more faithfully to share the stories of our success. The Connectional Table Group decided they needed to bring in the voices of annual conference leadership to help design this assessment tool so that they could gather the necessary and helpful information and avoid duplicate reporting. A few directors of Connectional Ministry joined members of this CT task force to work on the annual conference section of this Connectional Assessment Tool. And I'm going to let one of those DCMs, David Valera, tell you a little more about this process, what they learned, and what you can all expect from this process in the next quadrennium. David? Good morning and mabuhay. I am David Valera, Director of Connectional Ministries from the Pacific Northwest Annual Conference. I was one of the six directors of Connectional Ministries who met together to look at the annual conference section of the Connectional Assessment Tool. The purpose of our meetings and conference calls was to give feedback from the perspective of annual conference leadership who would be responsible for filling out this kind of role, this kind of tool. So yes, my fellow DCMs, I did represent this again in that portion that says, and all other portions of our jobs as, asked for us. <laughs> One of the clear values articulated by this task force was that this tool must be beneficial to us in our leadership of the annual conference. While this is a tool designed by the connectional table, it is designed to be a resource for annual conference self-assessment and learning, not judgment. We have found that this kind of questionnaire holds the potential to help annual conferences think about their own strategies to point them to other annual conferences who have faced similar challenges and can provide a clearer picture of the resources truly needed by annual conferences from the general church. The task force articulated clearly that this instrument can strengthen relationships between program agencies and the annual conferences for greater ministry impact. And to help gather information about the needs in our respective mission fields across the church, across the world. Here is what we are hoping for in terms of a rollout for this tool over the next couple of years. The tool will be completed and distributed to annual conference leadership in the first quarter of 2017 so that they have a year to read it, understand what is needed, and to consider whether or not additional data gathering might be necessary. The connectional table will have another opportunity in January to meet with the Associ Association of Directors of Connectional Ministries to get any final feedback and continue to deepen those key relationships. This will give directors of Connectional Ministries and conference leadership a chance to talk about this process at the respective annual conference of 2017. So that by the first quarter of 2018, we will begin to collect data. And in May of 2018, the hope is to report on the findings to the Connectional Table. The third quarter of 2018 is when the full report is, will be sent to all other conference leadership and simply put, becomes a part of denominational reality check. Thank you, David. The achievements we've celebrated and the goals that we set are important to name, especially the gathering like this, so that all of us in this room as leaders of the annual conference around the United States are on the same page, moving in the same direction, understanding the same language, even as we live it out in our unique contexts. I also know that the larger goals we've celebrated are only achieved through the expressions of faithfulness taking place in your annual conferences and in the local churches in your neighborhoods. I also know that there are probably at least a handful of you out there who are going, why do we need to set these goals? Why do we always have to be measuring this stuff? And why do we always have to be doing these assessment tools? Let me tell you a little story off script. 
When I was a district superintendent in a wonderful county seat town by the name of Worcester, Ohio, <laughs> thank you, it's my shout out to East Ohio, and um, that's where I, I started running. And one night, I was out running, it was shortly before school started, and I'd been running for a while when I came up to the high school. And just as I got to the high school, the boys cross country team pulled out of the high school and started running down the street the direction that I was about to go. So I thought to myself, I think I'm going to keep up with them. Now, I was easily 30 years older than the oldest person in that team. But I thought, I'm going to make that my goal. I'm going to keep up with them. And so I just ran my little heart out. But just as I got to the place where I needed to turn off to go home, I had to admit that they had pulled ahead of me enough that I really wasn't keeping up with them. And in those days, I used to keep track of my time. So when I got home, I looked at my time, and I had the best time I had had in a long, long time. I did not reach my goal to keep up with the boys' cross-country team, but I did better than I would have if I'd had just been out running. Now, I think sometimes that we in the church are a little bit like prima donnas or the gifted child that can't stand to take a goal because we're so afraid that if we don't meet that goal, we're going to feel bad. But I would suggest that if we make realistic stretch goals as these four areas of focus are for us as a denomination, we'll do better than what we would have done if we hadn't even made the goal. Look at Imagine No Malaria. Who thought we could even get to almost $70 million four years ago? So I would like for you, most of you are at tables uh, from the same conference. Some of you aren't, and that's okay too. I would like for you to take a few minutes and talk about what is it that you do in your annual conference around these four areas of focus? How are you working on vital congregations? How are you going to identify at least three communities to transform? How are you going to begin to go maybe in another direction with principal leaders? How are you going to be doing some of these things? Even if you use a different language, the function is the same. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to do that, and then I will, uh, there's some microphones. I will have, uh, I'll invite people uh, for a few minutes to just report on what, what you too will do in the coming months and years. So just spend a few minutes talking about what are we doing about vital congregations and the four areas of focus in our annual conference. Is there anybody who would like to go to one of these mics? They're kind of in the aisle of the cameras. And just very briefly, just share uh, something that you were talking about as an annual conference, so a way in which you've experienced uh, growth in vital congregations or work around the four areas of focus or the use of an, uh, maybe even the use of an agency. Anybody want to share something? If you would go to the mic. Because you're so shy. Any stories out there that you want to share with the full connection? Yes. Um, Diane McGeehee from the Texas annual, Texas annual Conference. If you would listen, please. Uh, so we've been working a lot on raising up principal leaders, both clergy and lay. Uh, we have a program we call Apple, where we are uh, intentionally equipping young clergy and all aspects of leadership across those four foci. 
Uh, we're also, um, we've got an endowment we've been working on for emerging leaders to help them with the cost of coming out of seminary and as well as just getting started. We've also developed a program called the Hispanic Apprenticeship Program where we're actually um, placing in churches um, Hispanic leadership for mentoring and then intentional placement in strategic communities uh, throughout the conference. We're about to uh, launch a cohort with, um, we hope about 40 lay and clergy leaders throughout the greater Houston area that's gonna work on uh, issues of reconciliation and the violence and the divides that we're um, experiencing as a nation and as communities in order to equip ourselves to actually be intentional about helping the church overcome those divisions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Over here at this other microphone. Mark Ogren from the Virginia Conference. At our 2006 annual conference, we had one of the most powerful Kairos moments on the floor of annual conference. One of our pastors stood and said he'd been looking over our end of the year reports. And he found that nearly 40% of our churches in Virginia, that's about 500 churches, had not had a profession of faith in the previous year or two years. I will tell you that um, there was a kind of collective gasp on the floor of our annual conference. And we had an incredible conversation then about what could we do. We had several uh, motions and ultimately what we did was we said, we want to start 250 new faith communities in the next 30 years. Bishop, that's a stretch goal. <laughs> Good. Uh, but I tell you what it has done for us. We spent, uh, then what we did, of course, is what all Methodists do, and that is we, um, we formed a team. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent two years on that team. Uh, you know, one of the things we discovered was that between uh, 1990 and, and 2005, um, this Virginia grew by 26%. Our state grew by 26%. During that same time, the Virginia Conference decreased by 3%. And that caught us. I mean, that's a, whoa. Um, so we developed this uh, plan, a strategy we call All Things New. And the focus was on starting new faith communities and renewing existing churches. That led us to focus on new faith communities, but when we did that team, what we also were aware that if we don't involve our existing churches in this process, it's not gonna go anywhere. It has resulted, we have 42 new faith communities since 2008, right. but it has a much wider impact because of the leadership assessment process we've developed, because of the renewal projects we're now doing within our existing churches and one example was uh, a new faith community started. They didn't have a place. They didn't have a building. And within the last two years, the gathering, led by Rachel Gilmore in the Virginia Beach area, have now partnered with an existing church that had 30 in worship, and they had a fantastic building. They had three cell phone towers to pay for their building. But that partnership now has resulted in a worshiping community, about 250 people on Sunday morning. Right. Uh, so, I could tell you a lot more, but yeah. that's been part of the story in Virginia. Thank you. Thanks be to God. And we often find that when we look at our numbers, we go down, but are we, you know, we go to the depths so that we can begin to work and um, bring them up. Yes, one last one, and then I'll open it for questions uh, if you have any. Rene Hernandez from the Florida Conference. Um, we were discussing in our table some of the things that we have been doing here in Florida. And, and one of the strategies has been what we call the church growth plan. So as a district superintendent, I have been meeting. I, first, I developed a team of people to uh, engage in conversations with local churches about fruitfulness and faithfulness. And uh, asking them questions like, what is your vision for the future? You will be surprised of how many churches are not having that conversation. Well, you wouldn't be surprised. 
they, they don't have a purpose, they don't have a plan. So, so engaging with them in the conversations about what is your future? Where do you see your church five years from now? Having the difficult conversations about apportionments, financial viability, uh, all of those pieces. But the number one conversation we're having is about disciple making. One thing we have learned from vital churches is that they have a strong uh, discipleship making processes. And also they have very well-defined leadership development processes. So helping churches to think about discipleship and leadership and a vision and a mission, a future, a strategies, some action steps that they could take for the next uh, year or two years, and then following up with them have proven to be a strategy that have brought up a lot of fruit in our midst. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Are there any questions that you want to raise? We have some of the general secretaries here who would um, be able to answer specific questions uh, uh, or about the process. Do you have any questions? If you would go to the mic. Andy Knoll from the Texas Annual Conference. I love the goals, uh, the 3 million, the 1 million, the 400. Uh, all the goals. Uh, my question is, by what method we will we drive those goals down to the annual conference and district levels so that our people really feel accountable for making those over the next four years? Great question. And um, as, as I said, in terms of the 400 communities, it's on an average of three. But I know that all of those other goals, maybe there's somebody from um, the one million um, or even the life-saving um, general secretary from discipleship, Junius Dotson, is going to go to a microphone, and he's going to give you an answer about the goal that he is the lead agency for. Good morning. I think it's a very good question. So let me begin by saying I'm general secretary for discipleship ministries. Uh, we are enthusiastically, number one, embracing that goal, one million new disciples. We are currently in a strategic planning process uh, in our house uh, that be, will be completed by March. One of the first things I did when I took office uh, was to uh, send out a, a survey and collect information and data from all of the annual conferences uh, here in the U.S. So that's kind of been a starting point uh, and certainly has informed our strategic making process. Secondly, uh, you, Bishop Park talked about the uh, Congregational Vitality Team from the Council of Bishops. We had a very fruitful conversation there this week thinking about strategically how we involve all of the annual conferences uh, and again build uh, ownership uh, from our residential bishops. So the fruit of that conversation will help to develop our full plan uh, as well. So those are two key inputs. Uh, and then thirdly, just kind of drawing on the best uh, of our resources uh, and, and minds internally uh, to get us there. So that's the long answer, but the short answer is, this is the beginning of an ongoing conversation. And my hope and, and prayer is, is that uh, every annual conference uh, will see their part in it and will be willing uh, to take ownership of it. So thank you very much. Great, I see two other general secretaries coming forward. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Kim Cape, I'm General Secretary of the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. Uh, three million principled Christian leaders, difference makers, is a, an ambitious goal, but one I believe that we can together achieve. Remember Bishop Carter's uh, image yesterday of the root system. Those are the leaders of our annual conferences. Those include you. And our goal is to help you resource and support the leadership development process in your annual conference. And we're going to be doing active listening and better connecting of uh, annual conference resources. Thank you. 
And I'm Susan Henry Crow from Church and Society. And as Bishop Dick has talked about ministry with the poor, we know that most of these stories are already out there. It's a matter of compiling them and bringing them together and bringing folks together um, who are working and walking along people who are poor so that there's agency for everybody and telling the stories and compiling the information and doing some pilot projects so other annual conferences can benefit. So in part, it's collecting information more than anything else and helping us tell our own story, which we sometimes have not done so well. Thank you. So in conclusion, what I would tell you is that through the work of the Connectional Table and the continuation of uh, the four areas of focus and vital congregations, we actually enter this quadrennium uh, much farther ahead than we have in the past. But even so, the, the lead agencies will be working on helping annual conferences to, um, to grab hold and to listen to them in terms of what they need so that we can fulfill these goals. As I like to say, what part of go don't we get?